Welcome back. In this video, we're going to discuss how we account for both the radial and thrust loads that a bearing may be under. So recall that when we identified a bearing, it was based on its rated catalog load, had a particular catalog life. Now those are experimentally determined based on probability of failure, and the problem that we now occur is uh, we, if we want to experimentally, te experimentally test a bearing, it's going to be, have to be at a specific load. Uh, so if we test it at a certain radial load, we get an answer, and that's our catalog rating. But in some situations, we're going to have bearings uh, that are going to have to face some, some thrust loads as well. And we're going to need to figure out a way to handle those thrust loads. Uh, so the approach that we're going to use is an iterative process. We have to kind of guess and check ourselves. And from that guessing and checking process, uh, we will eventually land on a bearing uh, that is appropriate for our situation. So let's begin. What we're going to do is replace our value before of FD with an equivalent force. So before, we had our application factor times our dynamic force times the life ratio and then the reliability parameters, x naught plus theta minus x naught multiplied times the ln of 1 over the reliability we want to the 1 over b, all of those shape parameters, and all of that to the 1 over a. What we're going to be doing is replacing this dynamic force with an equivalent force, Fe. And this Fe is based on a value of x and y of the, there's a factor v here for what we're talking about inner or outer rotating, times the radial force, plus a y factor, which will multiply times the axial portion of the force, or the thrust load. Right? So there are deep groove ball bearings and roller bearings are, are not designed to take axial loads. So if we imagine the bearing itself, uh, the inside and outer housing, like this, there's a ball in the center in a cage, and if the line of contact like, is like this, and we push any thrust loads on this bearing, you can see that that's going to cause some binding of this ball in here. And so instead, uh, we have what's called angular contact ball bearings, and I'll accentuate the angle here, such that the angle of contact, or the, the line of contact is at an angle, uh, which resists that thrust load. Uh, so we have angular contact ball bearings, uh, which we'll use when we have thrust loads. Uh, in general, uh, if you have any thrust loads, uh, start with angular contact ball bearings, and then if your thrust loads are very, very high, you're going to want to use tapered roller bearings. So in general, ball, deep groove ball bearings, so deep groove ball bearings and simple roller bearings will not be able to handle thrust loads. We will need uh, angular contact ball bearings in order to handle those. Uh, so the things that produce thrust loads, there can be lots. Uh, for example, helical gears on the shaft will produce a thrust load. Uh, that is a load that pushes the, ax, ax, um, the shaft into the bearing. Uh, we may also see uh, thrust loads generated by things that are turning, so your car will have tapered roller bearings on the wheels uh, we, because there is a thrust uh, load induced by that turning action, the dynamics of that. Uh, so there's several situations where you might see uh, some thrust loads, and so what we're going to have to do is a process to figure out these things. Uh, so to begin with, we have no idea necessarily what our x and y values ought to be. Uh, but there's a table that will help us uh, sort of guess and check, uh, and we'll move through an iterative process to find those. Uh, 
So let me outline that iterative process. So um, there are obviously lots of different ways you could start and solve this problem. Uh, and I present here a specific solution uh, approach, which I find to be successful in reducing the number of iterations so that you don't have to do as many steps as possible. Uh, so the process looks like this. First of all, I like to identify uh, the things that are not going to be changing in this iteration process and, fi and calculate those so that when I compare values later, uh, I don't need to calculate them over and over again. So the things that we're going to need, uh, which are not going to change uh, as we're looking at one particular bearing, is the ratio of the axial force compared to the radial force. Uh, with this parameter V. So V equals 1 if the inner ring is rotating and V should equal 1.2 if the outer ring is rotating. Uh, and this simply accounts for the fact that uh, if you hold the shaft uh, still and spin something like a gear or a wheel about the shaft, then it's like an axle, uh, that mo that line of action around the circle is longer, uh, so there's more potential for damage. Uh, that's why that uh, force is there, why that factor is there. Uh, but these values that we're calculating are based on the assumption that it's the inner ring, which is more common for the inner ring to be rotating. Um, the only time this is not true, one little caveat, is self-aligning bearings, which are very common. Um, if we have self-aligning bearings, basically uh, the V is always 1. Uh, they, they correct for this uh, outer ring rotation. Uh, that's just a little caveat. Uh, in our book, we're not using self-aligning bearings, so that's not going to be the issue. We'll look at either inner or outer rotating. So the other thing that's not going to change is our life based on the reliability that we want to get. Uh, so based on this equation that we had before of C10, uh, notice for a particular bearing, uh, whatever the bear size of the bearing, it's still going to be rotating uh, however many times we want it to. We're still going to be getting the reliability that we want it from, and it's still going to stay the same type of ball, angular th uh, contact ball bearing. Um, and our application factor is going to be constant too. So I like to calculate this constant, I like to calculate this constant life part so that we have our C10 equals our equivalent force, which is what we'll be calculating, multiplied times AF times our XD over the reliability that we want, X0 plus theta minus X0 times the LN of 1 over the reliability we want, raised to the 1 over B, and all of that to the 1 over A. Uh, so note that all of this uh, is constant throughout this iteration process. Um, so step one, if I was to write this in words, is calculate the constants. So those constants we'll need is this ratio and this uh, parameter, which we'll continue to plug and chug away uh, as we change our FE values. All right, step two is to guess an initial value for x and y. Now, assuming that we're looking at this process because we have some thrust loads and we think these thrust loads are significant, I suggest looking at the table in x2, uh, in the columns for x2 and y2, which assumes that the thrust loads are going to be significant and we need to account for them. If we're in the x1, y1 parameters, uh, what that basically is assuming is that the axial portion is not that significant, and we can basically ignore it. Uh, so assuming we care about the axial portion, we're not going to be ignore it. We'll start with x2 and y2. Another suggestion to have fewer iterations is to guess values in sort of the middle of the table. So if you have nothing to go off of, uh, if you haven't done a similar problem, uh, then I would suggest starting at the middle of the table. Now what do I mean by this table? Uh, you'll find it in the textbook uh, and it looks like this. So we're going to get, be guessing x1, x2, and y2 values 
uh, and I generally suggest starting somewhere uh, within the middle of the table. These will get you values uh, that are close, and then it, the next iterations will move about this table in a process which I'll talk about next. So our third step is going to be computing our uh, Fe equivalent force is the V times the radial x factor times the radial portion plus the y factor times our axial portion or our thrust load. That's the value that's going to be changing uh, as we look through this process. So we can then calculate a find a minimum C10 based on that uh, assumed XY values. So we will find a catalog C10 uh, based on the FE times that constant stuff, uh, which we calculated earlier. Uh, so here's why it makes sense to calculate that uh, once and not have to redo it over and over again. You can call it some parameter that you want uh, and just store it that way. Uh, and that will get us a C10 value, a minimum, and we'll need to look at our angular contact ball bearings to find a C10 that will work for us. So we'll look at the table, and we will look at this table under angular contact ball bearings, and we will find ourselves a C10 that will work. So for example, 31.9. Uh, so we had 30, we found a C10 of 30. Uh, the one that will work for us is the bearing of 40 millimeters uh, that has a supports a load of 31.9. All right, that's just an example. Uh, step five now is going to be to figure out how close or how good of a guess we had. And to do that, we need to figure out uh, how much uh, static load uh, so this was the dynamic loading, this is the static loading, the C-naught, uh, can be accounted for by that thrust load. So we're going to calculate, based on the bearing we've selected here, a catalog rating such that uh, we can calculate this FA over C-naught ratio. So this value of FA over C-naught tells us uh, how good of a guess our first guess was. So we can calculate FA over CO, and uh, we may find, uh, you'll likely find that it's not one of these values. It may be somewhere in between. So say, for example, it's somewhere in between here. Um, that means we need to pick a E value uh, that is somewhere in between. Uh, so we can linearly, linearly interpolate between these things, uh, but notice that the E values don't change uh, significantly between the two. So if you're about halfway uh, between these two values, uh, halfway would be 0.25. Um, so it's fairly easy to guess those, and we'll also interpolate between our X's and Y's as well. Um, so we calculate the FA in order to find a corresponding E value. This E value represents effectively how off your guess was. Um, it's uh, particularly the meniscus of the curve and the shape of that, um, but practically what you care about is the fact that uh, how good or bad your guess was. So you're going to then look at that E value and see if it's significant to you. Um, so if you overshoot, uh, you may find that you need to decrease the impact of that axial force and you'll be in one category. Uh, and if you undershoot shoot your guess, uh, you'll be continue looking uh, within the, the columns that have higher. So we're going to compare our E value and compare if that E value that corresponds uh, to this ratio is greater than that constant we factored in before, which was the axial force times V times the radial force and see if it's bigger or smaller. Um, and then we can look in this catalog. So if it is larger, 
uh, if it is if the ratio is smaller, that basically means axial force is not that big of a deal in our particular situation, and our next guess will be that y is zero, uh, and we can basically ignore the axial portion. If our factor fa is larger than this e value we calculate, then we're going to be in this column, uh, this x2 and, L and y2 column. Uh, so if that's the case, then we need to uh, estimate uh, where we would be. So if we are in this column and say our E value was 0.25, that means uh, we can linearly interpolate X is our constant, so it's 0 0.56, and the Y is somewhere between 1.71 and 1.85. And so if it was halfway between the E, we can also put it halfway between there. Uh, it's going to be something like 1.79. Uh, so we'll compare our E value and use that uh, comparison to find new values for our X parameters and our Y parameters. All right, so using those new parameters, we're going to calculate a new FE. This is our second iteration. Based on V is the same, we'll use our new x times our radial load plus our new y times our axial load uh, in order to calculate a new Fe. Uh, so you can hopefully see what this process is going. This new Fe means we can calculate a new C10 and potentially find we'll find a higher bearing that we need and this time it may put us that we need this value. Uh, and if that's the case then we're going to take the corresponding C0, come back to step uh, 5 here and repeat again. Um, so step 8 is effectively compute steps 4 uh, through 7 until uh, we need to stop. So if you get the same bearing C10 uh, over and over again, uh, you should stop because you're getting the same values. Um, or if the catalog rating that you're finding C10 of the previous one is uh, greater than your C10 you're finding now uh, of this current iteration, uh, you should stop. So if you're, if you're working your way up uh, in sizing, uh, you should be fine. If you're working your way down in sizing, uh, then you're probably uh, not within the right, right area. All right, um, so that's basically the process. And then we eventually find our C10 from the catalog, uh, a angular contact ball bearing that will handle the loads we're interested in. All right, let's see how this works in an example. So let's find a bearing that can handle a radial load of 1.2 kilonewtons and an axial load of 1.5 kilonewtons. So we know we're going to need an angular contact ball bearing. And we want this bearing to last uh, at 1800 uh, revolutions per minute to last for a 40 hour work week for 15 years. Uh, at, uh, let's just use the catalog rating of 90% reliability. I'll simplify things slightly. Uh, so we'll figure out the life that we want to get out of this thing and then follow our iterative process to go from there. Uh, so based on our application and our loading, uh, we can say that application factor 1.2 is appropriate. All right, so here's our process. First of all, we need to figure out the life ratio that we want to get out of this thing. So our L10 would be the speed that's under multiplied times the um, hours it needs to be running, and then 60 to get from minutes 
from hours to minutes. So the life we want to get out of this thing is 1800 RPMs, so 1800 revolutions, uh, going for 40 hours in a week. Uh, there tends to be about 50 work weeks a year if you consider uh, breaks and things like that. And we expect this thing to last for 15 years, uh, but we want the revolutions in minutes. Uh, so there's 60 minutes in an hour. We can multiply all these things together and come up with a life, a desired life that we want to get out of this bearing of 3.24 times 10 to the ninth uh, cycles or revolutions. Uh, so if this is a bearing where the inside is spinning, then our V equals 1, and I already said that our application factor uh, is 1.2. Uh, so let's begin this iteration process. Uh, so I said first, let's calculate the constants. So the constants that we care about, one is our FA over V times FR. Uh, in this situation, 1.5 divided by 1 times 1.2, or 1.25. That's one constant we'll care about. The other constant is all the stuff on the inside. Um, so for our situation, we had a f, our application factor. Uh, this will be all multiplied times our fe to be our c10. Uh, but we want to find all this constant stuff. So we had xd over the reliability stuff. Uh, but in this situation, we want 90% reliability. Um, so what we can do instead uh, is use the simpler form and we're going to have our application factor times our desired life, our xd, our desired life over our rated life raised to the 1 over a. And in this situation, since we know we're going to use ball bearings, a is going to be 3. Our constant life parameters, um, let's call it cl. Uh, just to have a name to give this thing, is 1.2 times 3.24 times 10 to the ninth cycles. Uh, and we can choose a particular manufacturer. Let's say this one has a cycle, uh, rated cycle life of a million cycles, uh, and raise that to the 1 over 3. Uh, that is a constant life parameter of about 17.75. And that's just a factor that we'll be multiplying times our effective load uh, to come up with what our catalog load needs to be. All right, so now we can begin the process uh, where we're going to be guessing our steps. So let's guess a value for x, x and y. Let's pick right smack dab in the middle 0 0.56 and 1.63. So if we have nothing else to go on, uh, we can just pick a value. So our first uh, x's and y's are going to be 0 0.56 and y equals 1.63. So this is a guess. Uh, and maybe right, maybe wrong, we have to find out. All right, so based on those values, we can calculate our Fe as 1 times 0 0.56 times our radial load, which was 1.2 kilonewtons. Uh, so again, we're doing this in all kilonewtons. Plus our 1.63 y factor times 1 and a half uh, kilonewtons. So our effective load, uh, based on our guess of x and y, is 3.07 kilonewtons. All right? So we can multiply that times our constants. Uh, and figure out just what type of rating we need. So our C10 then would be 3.07 our Fe times our constant load, uh, our constant life uh, thing that we had before, 
of 17.75. Uh, so that's that value. So putting those together gives a C10 of 54.549 uh, or 5 as a minimum. So now we need to find an angular contact ball bearing that will handle that load uh, for step number 5. We have 54.5. So we can look down our dynamic loading for 54.5. Uh, it looks like a bearing of a bore diameter of 60 uh, will work for that. And that has a C naught of 35.5. So our angular contact ball bearings, 02 series with a 60 millimeter bore, gives us a C10 of 55.9, which will be fine. Uh, it's larger than we need. And a C0, uh, that is the static load of 35 and a half. And the bore, again, is 60 millimeters. So now we need to get, figure out how good of a guess was that. And in order to do that, we calculate that ratio of the axial force compared to that static load. So our FA over C0 uh, in our situation is 1.5 divided by 35.5. Uh, so this gives us a fairly small value of 0 0.0423. And then we can look on the table, 11.1, one, uh, to find a corresponding E value to that. So let's look at that table. So we had 0 0.042, which happens to be this value exactly. Uh, and it happens to be that value because I worked this problem backwards for, as an example. Um, but that gets us an exact E value of 0 0.24. If it was a little higher, uh, maybe we'd want to interpolate and get a little bit higher E value. So now we need to decide, is that E value of 0.24 greater or smaller than this fraction in order to figure out which column we should be under? So recall that our constant that we calculated was 1.25. So indeed our E value uh, is smaller than our uh, ratio of FA over VFR. So we are still within the X2 and Y2 column, uh, but instead uh, what this is telling us is we should be choosing these X's and Y's as our values. So 0.56 again for x, it's a constant, and this time 1.85 for our new y. So let's calculate our new Fe. So our new Fe is going to be 1 for the v factor times 0 0.56, that doesn't change, times our radial load of 1.2, and this time we use 1.85 as our y factor times our axial load of one and a half. So this is our new y. Uh, this is our new x. It's exactly the same as the old one. Uh, and this tells us, uh, this value, uh, if we calculate it, gets us an Fe of 3.45 kilonewtons. Running through that process again, uh, we are beginning our iterations. Uh, we can calculate a new C10 equal to 3.45 times those constants that we had before, 17.75. So this is our new Fe. This is those constant life parameters that don't really change. This gets us a new minimum C10 of 63.7 kilonewtons. Notice that this was higher than our guess from before. So our guess from before was 54. Uh, now we need 63. All right, so that tells us, I'll just keep counting here as we are walking through this process, 
uh, that we need a higher C10, we can look in the catalog and see that the angular contact ball bearings with a uh, 65 millimeter bore. So we can look at the catalog and we find that the next one uh, will actually move up a bearing. Uh, so now we need to look at the 65 millimeter bore, uh, which can handle that load and has a static loading uh, of 41 and a half. So we can begin this step again. We're on our third iteration now and look at FA over C naught which in this case is going to be 1.5 divided by 41 and a half or 0 0.036. This is going to require us to iterate uh, for our E values. So in the tables, what you'll see is 0 0.028, 0 0.042, 0 0.045, and this equals, uh, or is equivalent to an E value of 0 0.22 and a value of 0 0.24. So 0 0.36 is somewhere in there, pretty close to halfway. Uh, and since these values are uh, pretty small steps between there, let's go with an E value of 0 0.23. Notice that this is still smaller than our 1.25, so we're still going to include uh, the, we're going to be looking in the X2 and Y2 catalog, uh, and we can inter literally interpolate between those two as well. So our Y value, if we go halfway between the two values uh, around it, ends up being 1.93. So finally, we can calculate, this would be our uh, third iteration of this equivalent force. We've got 0 0.56 times 1 times our radial load of 1.2 plus now our 1.93 times 1.5 uh, and now our equivalent force is 3.567. Okay, so now we can do the same process. We're gonna calculate one last uh, C10 here uh, and I'll show you why it's one last C10. Uh, if we plug in the Fe value again times that 17.75, which was the constant, uh, we end up getting 63.0 kilonewtons. Notice that this is actually smaller than our guess from, than our value we had before, uh, and also very close, uh, so 63.7 kilonewtons. Uh, so that means we're gonna end up basically at the same bearing. Um, so we should stop here uh, because we found a C10 which is smaller, and we're going to end up at, our, at the same bearing. Um, and if you choose, if this ended up putting you at the smaller bearing, you run these numbers again, you'd iterate between this bearing and the next bearing, just choose the next bearing, um, the higher one, uh, in order to, to basically stop this process and assure that you're getting the reliability you want. So the end result of this is that we need to pick an angular contact ball bearing uh, from the 02 series with a 65 millimeter bore diameter. Uh, and that would be our selection for that bearing uh, at 90% reliability. If we want higher reliability, again, we're gonna have to use the appropriate process and choose a higher rated bearing. All right, so that was quite a long process, uh, but I wanted to walk through uh, the full iterations. Uh, if we had chosen different X and Y values, we may have gotten this in one guess, uh, and we could have also chosen poor guesses and done four or five iterations. Um, but again, the process uh, between just plugging in new FE values and XYs is not very complicated. It's just a little tedious. Uh, but in the end, what you end up doing is finding a C10, which is smaller than your previous one. Uh, and that means that we are at the point where we should stop. Uh, so that is our 65 millimeter bore diameter uh, bearing that we finally selected. All right, that'll about do it for this video. Until next time.